Okay. Hello, friends. I'm actually more or less on time today. How do you like that? Uh, welcome, uh, Savvy and Michelle and whoever else uh, may or may not be here. Uh, sorry, I was not late as you were depending on me to be, Michelle. I, uh, I actually totally lost track of time, too, but I remember just in time. I didn't have uh, time to eat dinner first, but, you know, that's why God invented protein bars. I am doing pretty good today. Uh, thank you for asking, Sappy. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful, very warm, sunny day, and uh, Pepper has decided that he's very into this cardboard box I left sitting on the floor, so I don't know if he's going to actually make an appearance. I didn't, uh, I didn't notice until it was too late to move the box up onto the couch where he might actually sit uh, in, in camera range. You can, you can see. There he is. There he is. Pepper. Pepper. <laughs> He's like, uh, I'm busy. Anyway, there's here. That might be as much cat time as you guys get today. Oh, all right. Well, um, I like to give people a couple of minutes just in case uh, they don't get their notifications until their, their hands are full with something else. Give them a second to hustle on over here to video. Uh, we will be, oh, I didn't say my thing. Welcome to another installment of the Isolated Literary Society presents Cowboy Fang Space Bar and Grill. We read uh, chapter one and some of two yesterday. We'll be finishing up chapter two today and uh, reading at least three. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I felt like I had something else to say. Don't know what it. Don't know what it was going to be. So, um, had such a good turnout yesterday. Where is everyone? No, well, they're lost. Okay. Where was I? All right. Cool. So, um, as you recall, we were just introduced to all these characters. Um. And then someone was shot. Uh, and then uh, the last thing we heard was uh, Billy, our main character, our narrator, um, trying to uh, process the experience of um, being interviewed by police and on a strange planet and also trying to hide from them that you just traveled there through space and time. Uh, after witnessing someone get shot, uh, yeah, it that's a lot. So the very last line was, my last conscious thought was, how the hell am I supposed to play tonight? Just to get you all caught up where we are starting. So let's get into it. The answer was in a fog. And I'm not sure the others were doing much better. I remember none of our usual arguing over the set list, nor do I remember any details of the performance itself, except that at one point I had trouble with my jammed finger, but I don't even know what song we were doing. I kept getting the shakes in the middle of tunes and almost losing it. I tried to lose myself in the music, but then I'd remember why I was trying to do so and I'd get the shakes again. During the first break, Tom started talking to the woman we'd noticed the night before. During the second break, he introduced me to her and her friend. I probably forgot both of their names, but then I might not have been able to come up with my own if I needed to in a hurry. When the show was over, I noticed Tom rushing to put his instruments away, I guess to go talk to his new friend. I took some time putting mine away. I sat on the stage and took two deep breaths. There were policemen here, someone said. Uh, excuse me? Well, I forgot to close the blinds. Hold on, I'm about to get blinded. <clears throat> okay, back. Oh, wow, reread the whole first chapter to get yourself uh, caught up again. <laughs> 
that is commitment, Michelle. I appreciate it. <clears throat> right. There were police here, someone said. Excuse me? I'm wondering why there were police here earlier today. A red-headed woman with bright green eyes that were probably tinted contacts sat at the table at the edge of the stage, or near the stage, drinking something clear out of a Tom Collins glass. There was fruit in it. After a moment, I had placed her as the woman who'd arrived with Tom's friend. I said, someone was shot in the bathroom this morning. Her eyes widened. Shot dead? Yes. That's pretty scary. Her English had the barest trace of French accent, but was otherwise faintly Oxford. I'm not going to attempt to do that accent. I'm just going to do the character, get the vibe of the character, you know. <clears throat> I said, I was right there when it happened. It scared the hell out of me. I would imagine it. I would it imagine? I have never noticed that before. Is that supposed to be, is that a typo or is that supposed to be? her uh, like tipping that she speaks French and she messed up the English sy syntax. I don't know if that makes French in, uh, makes sense in French syntax. Look, I've only been doing French on Duolingo for two days. No, t 10 days. I'm a 10 day streak, you guys. And the last time I took any French was two years, 20 years ago. So, you know, I would it imagine. I realized that I wanted her to keep talking because I liked her accent, so I contrived to do so. She gave me her name, and I forgot it, and she gave it to me again. Susi. Pronounced Sue as if taking someone to court, with an accent on the C. I got us coffee, and we covered a variety of subjects, but always came back to the dead man. I said, it's one thing to know you're going to die someday. It's another to see it happen so suddenly like that. You can't help identifying with him. I know, she said. But think about it. Your whole life, all your plans, everything you're going to do tomorrow and the next year and the things you want to see and then bam, it's over. I know. It's how fast it happened. That's what gets to me. I don't think you should think about it anymore right now, she said. I guess. I shuddered. Let's get some food. They'll still serve if we hurry. I could eat a little, she said. Fangs always serve food until at least 3.30, and we were picking at the remains of French onion soup and Cajun blackened chicken until something like four o'clock. I learned that Susie was local, didn't really care for Irish music, but her friend, the blonde, did, and Susie allowed that we were all right. She said she was a dancer. I raised an eyebrow, and she looked her, as she shook her head. No. I dance for clubs like Montague's, as if that should explain things. She added, I do not strip, as if it were perfectly reasonable for me to wonder. Okay, I said, and we went on from there. I can no more remember that conversation in detail than I can remember playing that evening, but it went on for a long time. When the day finally caught up with me and each eyelid acquired a 10-pound weight, I asked Susie if she'd like to crash in the corner of the storage area where I kept my futon. It didn't seem odd at the time, and she said yes, and I fell asleep almost at once. Susie, curled up in my arms, was soft and warm. She was still asleep when I woke up. It was only when I saw her there, asleep, that I realized just how beautiful she was. Which was odd, because I'm not normally that slow to notice, and mornings aren't kind to anyone. She had a few freckles, and her hair may have been dyed, but she had the complexion to match it. Her, che her cheekbones were high and quite pronounced, and the line of her jaw was emphatic, almost West Indian, ending in a very strong chin. Her eyes were deeply set, her brows fine, and there was a permanent, very slight pout to her lips. Her skin looked like fine silk. Her face, taken as a whole, was almost otherworldly, with an odd sort of perfection that hit me very hard. You know, reading that description, I'm just realizing that I don't know that I really took all of that description into account in my image of Sissy. Like, my picture of Sissy in my head certainly has green eyes and red hair. Um, but I think the other, other than that, the way that she looks to me is more informed by her character than by the specific descriptions. Anyway. <clears throat> 
It was impossible to see what the rest of her looked like under the blankets, but from what I recalled from the night before, she had no excess weight and all the right curves, Stephen. I know this was 1990, but really, all the right curves, no excess weight. We'll let it pass. I wondered how in the world I'd been able to fall asleep so easily with her next to me. She woke up and caught me staring at her. I quickly looked away and said, good morning, want some coffee? Mmm, she stretched. Cream. What? Oh, uh, right. When I went to get the coffee, I found Tom sitting in a booth with the blonde. They were on the same side of the booth. Tom was leaning forward with his hands on the table in front of him. She was leaning back, her hands folded over her stomach. I could tell right away that neither of them had had, had, had any sleep. There was a coffee decanter on the table in front of them. Good morning, folks, I said. Carolyn, you missed a very important part of I know, chapter two. I know, I'm so sorry. And you had to close the blinds yourself. I know, it what? was so arduous. <laughs> what, is, what is wrong with me? Well, just to get you caught up. Neglect uh, After the whole the shooting and everything, and then you know, did that, he sleeps for a little while. Then he plays a gig. He's he's all in a, in a you know, in a right. world. Right. And then a uh, very pretty red-headed lady. Mm, um, that he noticed. Pretty and red hair. <laughs> from the night before. Does she have any other characteristics? Well, I'm not going to read the description because it'll annoy you. <laughs> ah, okay, great. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, we're going to let it, we're letting it slide. Yeah. It was 1990. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, they have a conversation. Her name is Susie. She has a, Ooh. she speaks uh, English with a Oxford accent with a slight, faint trace of French. Does she have a, a band of banshees mm -hmm. to sing with her? Uh, no. It's spelled S <laughs> O U C I, like the oh. French name. Oh, I didn't realize that was a name. I think I've seen it as like a. I've never heard it as a first name outside of this book, but oh, this okay. book is also in the future. Mm. So maybe it will become Ooh. a first name. Anyway. <laughs> uh, they talk all night and then he invites her to crash in the, you know, on the futon in the storeroom with him, which he realizes the next morning was weird, but she didn't act like it was. And now they make waking up and he's getting them coffee. So mm. he is, uh, he has just noticed that Tom and the blonde who is friends with Susie, the blonde that Tom knows the night before and said was the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. Uh, Anyways, yes. they are sitting in a booth together and it appears they have not slept. Mm. Uh, I could tell right away, neither of them had had any sleep. There was a coffee decanter on the table in front of them. Good morning, folks, I said. Don't say that, said Tom, screwing his face into a grimace. Sorry. Uh, this is Carrie. Carrie, that's Billy. He blinked several times rapidly. Nice to meet you, I said. She nodded. Tom said, what time is it? I don't know. Do you really want me to find out? Well, no, said Tom. When I came back that way with coffee, his friend was leaning forward her head next to his in that position that always gives me the impression that people are exchanging thoughts directly through their foreheads. I left them alone. I set the coffee down, ran off to use the men's room. When I got back, I sipped at my coffee. I told Susie the police markings were there, were still on the floor in there. I licked my lips. It was a strange thing for me. She nodded. I suppose you pretty much hated it. Yeah, I said, pretty much. Not half as much as he did, though. You ever been there when someone was killed? No. She tilted her head to the side and pursed her lips and said, I almost killed someone once, though. I said, oh? I threw a desk chair at him down three flights of stairs. Damn. You're kidding. He was my boyfriend. We were at a party at our own house, and he was, what is the phrase? Coming on to his ex-girlfriend. What happened to him? He stopped coming on to her. No, I mean, oh, it missed his head but broke his collarbone. I used to have a nasty temper, she added judici judiciously. <laughs> I guess, but now you're a pussycat, right? She smiled. Then she said, you were pretty tired last night. I nodded and upset. I could tell. How? I asked intending the question to be sarcastic. You didn't make a pass at me. This took me back a bit. I wondered if it was the norm in this society to be that direct. I suspected it wasn't. 
I almost asked if she expected every man she hung out with to make a pass at her, but I didn't because on reflection, it would have been a pretty stupid question. <laughs> so I said, did you want me to? I wanted my tone to be light and bantering, but it didn't come out that way. Yes, she said. I sat there for a length of a couple of breaths while I checked with my short-term memory to make sure I'd heard that correctly and checked with my facial expression interpreters to make sure I wasn't being laughed at. I felt my heart pounding. You could make a pass at me, I heard myself saying. Want to make love, she said. Yes. I was surprised at how even my voice was. One, night th one nice thing about mornings is how much energy I have. Her too. <clears throat> well, that escalated quickly. <laughs> well, you missed the meeting. I, I uh, gave you their whole meeting and their whole initial conversation gotcha. in a nutshell. So you, you did miss. Okay. It, it, it did escalate quickly. <laughs> okay. But plenty of people sleep with people that they've just met and don't wait for the next day. So That is, that is very true. It's not the fastest something has ever escalated. No. Hi there. Hmm. Move over this way just a bit. Hmm. I like that. Hmm, me too. I just changed my mind about something. What? I think I want to get an apartment after all. What do you mean? I've been thinking about just staying here for a while, but why would you do that? It's cheap. But... All right. I changed my mind. Hmm. Do you think you might be able to help me find a place? Let me go home and change first. I'll buy you breakfast when you get back. Okay. it would be a very weird conversation to have with someone you just met. Yes. I think I'll get an apartment. I was just going to, like, live in this bar for a while. I'm sorry. <laughs> Also, really? assuming this is all happening right. on the floor of yeah, the, yeah, the restaurant on the somewhere. on the futon in the on in the on the floor in the back room where he and the band have been sleeping right. for the last couple of jumps, I think they right. say. Yeah, because the last couple of jumps, once they arrived, the place was already right, uh, like uh, in in the midst of serious business. Yes. <clears throat> when she came back about an hour later. She was wearing a loose-fitting black sweater, low black boots with high heels, and baggy black pants. I almost jumped her again, but instead bought her hash brown potatoes made with green peppers, red peppers, mushrooms, and onions, a soft-boiled egg, and English muffins. Oh my god, I forgot how he talks about food in this book. <sighs> I really should have eaten dinner before I made that stream. <laughs> <clears throat> I had the same, except I had a bagel. We both had a great deal of Fang's roast coffee, and then we attacked the out-of-doors. It took me a moment to work up the courage to step outside, but I did at last, and stopped, cold. What is it, Billy? It's just nothing. I'm just enjoying the morning. Afternoon. Whatever. I'd gotten a look out the window before, but I hadn't been outside. Think of a high, deep blue, the air rippling like it does off the pavement on hot days, and no clouds and a small, pale yellow sun set in the middle of it like it was lost. This was my first view of New Quebec on Laurier around Chaucer. Across the street, yes, it was certainly a bakery. To my left was a square little shop whose sign read Salon de Coiffure pour les chiens. The best French pronunciation ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Duolingo. <clears throat> uh. I mean, the accent was bad, but all the pronunciation was right, at least. <laughs> ah. Michelle said, I knew coffee was big in this chapter, so I made myself some decaf. <laughs> good, 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 wise move. Uh, to my right was a very tall building that could have been a grocer or a drugstore. Streets, at least the three I could see from the door, were wide and very clean, as if they'd been scrubbed. And buildings were widely spaced and quite varied. There was a Victorian mansion with five towers and three chimneys and a bright red door just down the way, and next to it what seemed to be an underground bunker, and what could have been a church that wasn't was to our left. What could have been a church but wasn't was to our left. What was a church was to our right across the street, and next to it was a small storefront looking naked like with nothing touching it, 
And just beyond that, a tall businessy looking place with lots of reflective windows. I made a note to see what it looked like at sunset after establishing which direction could be considered west. It was, for the record, left as we stepped outside, so the old west wall was the north wall, if you chose to look at it that way. There were a few people on the street. One elderly couple leaving the store, a man carrying an infant across his chest, two girls looking in the bakery window. They looked like people, with nothing to distinguish them from anyone on the streets of Ibrium City or Jerrysport, and it seemed that, for how far we'd come in time and space, there should have been more. But what really got to me was a little thing. The street signs looked just about the same as they had back home, where I call home, before London. I hadn't consciously expected anything else. I hadn't thought about it, but I was startled. We were standing on Lavelle with Valois running just to our left. There was a breeze from my left to my right that brought the temperature down to where I almost got goosebumps. And when the, t t and when the wind stilled, the back of my neck felt hot where the sun struck it. I tried to remember if people here seemed exceptionally pale or unusually tanned, but I couldn't remember, so I guess not. The breeze brought me a smell that might have been cinnamon, but might not have been. I held out my hand, and Susie took it. And we walked that way, and a bird made a funny low whistling sound as we crossed a wide street called Le Duc. And we looked for apartments we didn't... And as we looked for apartments, we didn't say much that stays in my memory, but I think we learned a great deal about each other. She found a third-floor place with a six unit, in a six-unit house built of gray bricks. It was right up against the street, and both taller than the houses around it and set apart from them, as if it were looming over the street to pounce on pedestrians. It was only half a mile from Fangs. It was clean, affordable, and the landlord or caretaker or whatever spoke passable English, a big plus as far as I was concerned. The apartment was much larger than I was going to need and included a view that looked out over the Quebec, the local river. Rent was extremely cheap, but that was usually the case with colonies. Lodging and food are cheap, clothing and entertainment cost. Anyway, it turned out I could pay a month's rent. Fortunately, this colony didn't have such customs as forced marriages, trial by ordeal, or damage deposits. With what we'd gotten for the last two nights of playing. It left me with nothing for food, but I could pile up debts at Fangs or local customs permitting, earn some extra money playing on the street with Tom. I asked Susie about it, and she said that local, local customs would indeed permit, and she indicated that if I chose to do this, I should warn her in time for her to be, I should warn her in time for her to be well away from the area. I was beginning to realize that, in some ways, she was not a nice person. I paid, got the key, and asked if it was possible to rent furniture. Well, yes, but it was expensive. I shrugged. I had my blanket and futon, and the floor of the place was carpeted. What else did I need? Before going back to Feng's, Sissy and I made love on the carpet, and it was a very fine thing indeed. We rested then, and I wondered about many things. And that is the end of chapter two. And I just spilled water on myself. That's fun. Honestly, I... Part of me gets is like mad that I love the line. I don't remember anything specific we talked about while we were looking for apartments, but I feel like we learned a great deal about each other. That's like a really good way to describe when you're just getting to know someone and sometimes you're just talking and you don't remember anything specific, but right. you do feel like you're getting to know that person. Yeah. But part of me is like, how do you have that kind of conversation with someone while you're trying to hide that you are an time and space traveler oh. who has just landed in this city through mysterious means. Like, you know, it's, it's just like, how do you, they, I guess they've been there two days already. Yeah. So they've been able to kind of observe some things. Presumably, you know, they'd be sharing information. Oh, I overheard someone say things. So presumably this is true of this place, but like, right. It's just a part of me. is like, how, how? Right. Yeah. But also I'm weirdly obsessed with the idea of being randomly thrown into an unfamiliar place and having to kind of figure out what to say and what not to say hmm. and like what figuring out what you need. I don't know. I really like those kind of stories and I've never written one, but I've always wanted to. Hmm. I've never just had a specifically good idea for one. But somebody is for some reason is suddenly in a place, maybe a country, maybe a planet or a time where they hmm. are not, they do not belong, but they have to hide the fact that they do not belong there. Right. And just kind of figure out what's going on. 
I guess it's it's because it's sort of what you do when you're reading a book that's not set in, uh, you know, the present day in your own mm. on your own planet. Because you're as you're reading, you're trying to figure out what's going on. What are the rules of this place? Right. Just by reading, without being able to ask any questions. I don't no. know. Maybe that's why I like it. Anyway, <clears throat> we have another intermezzo. I am a little beggar man, and begging I have been for three score or more on this little isle of green. So I just said begging I have been. So I could rhyme with green. That's from the beggar men, traditional. Define center as a place where time turns to ice. Chip, chip, you go, and a chunk breaks off. You'll look at it later and say, that was it. A chunk of the ice of life, so to speak. Then it will be the apex or the center point or the deepest part of the valley or however you wish to consider a series of events viewed as a two-dimensional array of the data points we call incidents. We're picking one and we're calling it pivotal because among other reasons, it is. But remember please that you can't have any sort of perspective about it while it's in the process of happening. And if you try, you'll just confuse yourself. Perspective is for then, occurrence is for now. Now, Rich said, what happened? Linda said, none of your fucking business. The exchange took a little less than 10 seconds and can be seen as the moment to which everything had been building and the from which the change occurred. Rich's immediate reaction was, I wonder if it would bother me as much as if she didn't seem to like it. Well, yes, but in a different way, maybe a cleaner way. But he shook his head at that. The last year with his wife's succession of lovers had taught him to view his own reactions with a little more cynicism than that. Why am I putting up with this? Rich had been, among other things, a crisis counselor and was thus operating under the impression that he ought to be able to figure out what, for example, he was getting out of his relationship with his wife of five years that made it worth going through this. He was wrong, of course. Three nights ago, she'd come home with welts on her thighs and he'd been too, too stunned to say anything. Maybe I'm not quite as blasé as I'd like to think, had been his reaction then. And over the next three days, he'd given himself hell for that reaction and for not confronting her about it directly. So tonight, when she was undressing and he saw bruise marks on her breasts, he gathered his courage and asked about them directly and been told, none of your fucking business, which left him asking why he put up with any of it. For another timeless three seconds of ice, he stood there, then... I'm going for a walk, he said suddenly. And because he was feeling nasty, he added, I might be back. She didn't answer, and this caught him for a moment. And that moment was filled with changes and rearrangements in thinking and feeling that wouldn't settle in fully for years. In brief, why is she that certain I can't be serious? And then, aren't I? He stopped, half in and half out of the door, and realized with the feeling of a weight lifting from his shoulders and a simultaneous pang that, in fact, he wouldn't be back. He wondered how Linda would react. But the scary thing was that, as near as he could tell, he really, honestly, couldn't care less. An end, a beginning, and a center point. The door closed behind him with a hollow sound. Ah, uh, hello, Aaron. Welcome back. All right, we are going on to chapter three. <clears throat> chapter three. As we rolled down to Fenario, our captain fell in love with a lady like a dove, and her name it was called Pretty Peggio. Peggio, traditional. It was early evening when I brought her to Feng's to buy her another meal by way of saying thank you for helping me find the apartment. We took a different route back, a more hilly set of streets, by way of Le Duc up to Lavelle. We passed a low brick building with a small hand-lettered sign, she said. Oh, as we passed a low brick building with a small hand-lettered sign, she said, that's my agency. Oh, yeah, you missed the part of the first introduction where uh, he asks what she does, and she says, I dance. Mm. And he raises his eyebrow, and she goes, no, not like that. Uh, I dance for clubs like Montagues, as if that will explain mm. the situation. And then she adds... Oh, I do not strip, but she says it in a very matter of fact way, like it would have been perfectly reasonable for him to right. uh, assume that. So right. that tells us a little something about this culture, but yes. only a very little. Yes. <clears throat> That's my agency, she says. Do they keep you working a lot? 
As much as I want, she said. That's good. Yes. She held my hand. There was a glow somewhere in my middle. It frightened me. We arrived at Fang's, and I was pleased that my favorite booth beneath the cheerful Chinaman was unoccupied. We sat next to each other. Susie looked into the tap room and pointed at the model Colt 44 peacemaker on the wall and said, Is that real? No, I said, it's a replica, but that's real. I nodded toward the suit of armor in the corner. She studied it, then glanced at the painting over the stage with an Indian shooting a machine gun from the window of an old Duesenberg at a covered wagon while the knights in the wagon threw spears back at the car. This is a really weird place, she said. Tell me about it. Somebody commented on the the post I made on Twitter saying I was going to be reading this book and said, I had a replica made of the painting described in that book and it hangs in my house. And I couldn't remember what painting she was talking about. And now I'm so delighted to learn it's apparently that this one I just described. Apparently. Also, I guess we can do, do we allow someone saying Indian when they mean Native American in a book from 1990? Sure. Yeah. I don't know. 19, I mean, 1990. Is that actually? I, well, I, uh, I have not heard that that's a slur. It's not a slur. It's just inaccurate. Well, yes. Uh, I do know a lot of Native American people uh, choose to use that word themselves. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, I don't know how Indian people feel about that. So, Indeed. It is uh, confusing. Which is why I don't use it. But I, <clears throat> yeah. I, I do know, I have known... A, Native American people who do yeah. describe themselves. That's why I feel like if a Native American person wants to use that word, I say, I'm not going to tell them not to. However, I'm never going to use it. And if a white person uses it, I'm going to slightly raise my eyebrow at them at the very least. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, in this <clears throat> case, we can tell from the context that that's probably what's yes intended because it's supposed to be it, a riff on Old West it's a, yeah, it's pictures that Cowboys we, and Indians we kind be, of situation. Yeah, right. familiar with. And the covered wagon is mentioned. Yeah. Right. Uh, but still. So we're supposed to know like the type of artwork that this is and yet also it's tweaked. Yeah. Anyway. <clears throat> we ordered and talked more and the food came and we ate it. She didn't like my wine choice, but agreed that the chicken and champagne sauce was pretty spectacular. I'll note in passing that the colonists on New Quebec took better care of their chickens than most places I'd been, so it did, in fact, taste even better than usual. Fred was on duty, so I introduced her to him. When he'd left, she said, Kind of cold, isn't he? I said, Huh? Oh, just when he's working. Hmm, she said. He tried to throw me out last night. When? After you finished playing. I'll kill him. She smiled. She had dimples. There was a dropping sensation in my chest. About then, Rose joined us, and I introduced them as well. I like your necklace, said Rose. It's like the one Tracy de Vanois wore in Leeches. I haven't seen that. Is it good? Yeah. The first time Paul... Um, <clears throat> the first time Paul Long... Longduc? 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 I have no idea how to pronounce that French name. Came out of the lake. I screamed so loud, I got a sore throat. That's what happened to me the first time I saw A Nightmare on Elm Street. You saw that too. Those claws. I know. And alien. When the alien comes through, don't say it. Did you see the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers? About 90 times, said Susie. What about Creep Show? Yeah. What made it so scary is how matter of fact it all was, you know? I know. Just like City of Terror, where the buggish things start eating through the walls and everyone just watches? Ish. I didn't see that, said Rose. But, excuse me, sis, I said. Do you know where Jamie is? She blinked at me and, uh, she looked at me and blinked. Gone, she said. Which meant that he'd either stepped out for a moment or been hit by a bus and she couldn't care less which it was. And it would be wise if I didn't bring up the subject again. Right, I said. I rented an apartment just down the road. There's room for all of us if you guys want to help on the rent. The band, and sometimes Rich and Eve, had lived together off and on in London and before, and we could stand it when we had to. Rose nodded. It sounds fine, as long as that man isn't around. That man is one of the ways she refers to Jamie when she isn't happy with him. Jim is another. Or James. I keep track during dull moments. This time I nodded and ignored it. 
since these things never make a practical difference in anything, either of them does. Is it big? Big enough, I said. Two bedrooms and a den, and someone can sleep in the living room if... I caught myself before saying, if you and Jamie aren't sleeping together, and said, if things work out that way. The rent is pretty cheap. She agreed to think about it. Then she and Susie went back to discussing monsters, and I concentrated on my food. Eventually, I drifted off to find Tom. He was curled up in, his, in the corner of the storeroom, fully clothed, with the blonde he'd introduced as Carrie. They snored in unison. They looked very cute. I was disgusted. <laughs> then I went back to the table. <clears throat> Rose, well, when I went back to the table, Rose and Susie were gone. I felt a pang, which I shook off as stupid. Having sex isn't precisely the same as a lifetime commitment. I was annoyed at how relieved I was when they came back a few minutes later and Susie sat down next to me. She said, I'm dancing tonight at La Violette. Do you want to come down? There was something guarded in her voice as if she was trying to sound like she didn't care too much. I said, they have dancing on Sundays? Seven days a week, she said. Is there a cover? A what? Uh, do they charge you to get in? Oh, yes, but I'll get you on the list. And Rose, too. Thanks, said Rosie. You'll really be there. With bells on. What? Uh, yes, really. For sure. Where are you from, anyway? I shrugged. Lots of places, never mind. Uh, should we go to the bar and have a drink? <laughs> that was a good call. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'd like that, said Susie. Whiskey, agreed Rose. I signed the check, and Susie, Rose, and I moved around the corner to sit at the bar with our backs to the stage. Hey, Libby love, this is my friend Susie. How'd you do, said Libby. Hi, said Susie. Libby wiped the bar in front of us, put a toothpick in her mouth, and said, What would you like? Uh, do you have Juliana Dark? Uh, no, but we have Dos Equis. Where's that? What's that? It's imported. Um, just try it. If you don't like it, I'll give you something else. Uh, what about you, Billy? Beer, I said. Uh, right. And you want whiskey, Rose? Whiskey, she agreed. Should I run a tab? Yeah, I said. The liquor showed up, and Susie decided the Dos Equis was good enough if one added lime. Libby polished the bar in front of me and said, I haven't really had a chance to ask you. Are you doing all right? You mean from yesterday? Hell yeah, thanks to you. Right, she laughed a laugh. I'm highly skilled. Take two of these and talk to me when you wake up. I shrugged. It was what I needed. Good. How about you? What about me? Well, losing a patient. Man, you don't have to worry about me. I've lost patients before. She shrugged. I don't like it, but if I'm going to get bummed out, I might as well give up. Uh, Aaron, I did not get a picture of the painting, but I'm going to reply. I didn't reply to the tweet because I was like, I don't remember what painting she's referring to or they're referring to, but I will wait till I get to that point in the book and then I will reply. And now that I have, I'm totally going to reply to that tweet and be like, uh, please uh, pick so it didn't happen. <laughs> I hope I'm not misremembering what the tweet was and it's going to turn out they said something totally different and it's not that they have a copy of that painting because mm. that would make it really sad. That's how I remember it. It was only yesterday. So one would think. <clears throat> Rose said, I thought you did give up on it, which is why you're at Fangs. Hell no. Fangs wanted to find someone who could tend bar and be a paramedic. Are you joking? Asked Rose. No, I'm not joking. That was what I applied for. Weird. Did Fangs say why? Libby smiled. Wouldn't you like to know? I said, how's the place been going? All right. There's the usual percentage of jerks. One guy wanted a Le Fleur ale, and when I said we didn't have it, he asked if we had anything local, like it was some big political deal or something. What did you say? She laughed. I told him we only had imported beer to drink and local assholes to drink it. He stormed out. She polished the bar some more, still chuckling. That's a very good line. <laughs> <clears throat> How was... <laughs> said fucking hipsters. <laughs> Although, it is a bit weird... If you go into a bar, I don't know, maybe that's just weird from a Seattle perspective. Go into a bar and they don't have any local beers. Yeah, I feel like that would probably be weird in those places. Yeah. But because you'd think that they would have gotten in some local beer. Well, I guess it's only been a couple of days. Yeah. They, they, they plan to get local beer, but they have to sell the things they have to get local currency first. Right. Yeah. 
There's probably other things they were uh, running out of more. Yeah. Like chicken, obviously. Mm, yes. Free range uh, chicken. Yeah. <laughs> How was business during the show last night? Fine. Good. I don't ever want to know what I sounded like on stage, though. You were okay, said Susie. There said Libby. Susie was supposed to have added something similar there, but she missed her cue. Oh, okay. well. I stared into my glass. It's scary having it happen right here where we feel so safe and dealing with the police and everything. And now, did you find out anything? No, there was no way to get a good description of the guy. There were too many witnesses. I understand. None of us saw it happen? No. Fred was out of the room and I was getting the bar ready. As far as I can tell, the guy went to the bathroom. Someone followed him there, shot him four or five times as he was opening the door. As you said, said Susie, you're better off than he is. Maybe, said Rose. What do you mean, said Susie? Billy's alive. There might be worse things than dying. Like what, said Libby, before Susie or I could. I don't know, like maybe being reincarnated is something horrible. Oh, I said. Libby nodded thoughtfully. Susie said, that's some shit. How do you know, said Rose. Have you ever died? Have you? No, but I have a friend back, um, well, a while back, who was dying of Hag's disease, and he said he could feel he should have been shot, said Susie. You're joking, said Rose. No, I mean it. Anyone who has that and won't stay away from... It isn't all that contagious, said Libby. I don't care. It's 100% fatal. It's, uh, let's not talk about it, all right? Okay, I said. We'll talk about something cheerful, like the guy who was shot down in front of me. <laughs> I paused, considering. I still wonder about his last words. Did it mean something or what? Libby shrugged. The cops will probably figure it out. <clears throat> he said something to you? Asked Susie. Nothing that makes sense, I said. Oh, didn't I mention that? Just as he was falling over, he sort of looked at me and said, Sugar Bear. I wasn't certain, but I had the impression that Susie started when I said that. I looked a question at her, but she looked it back. She said, well, it's all pretty weird. Yeah. Look, I should be blasting off. Oh, already? I'll see you tonight, then. Yeah. And she stood up and left. When she was almost gone, I called after her. What should I tell your friend? I'd forgotten her name. But Susie didn't answer. She just turned the corner into the dining room, and then I heard the front door open and close. I sat there drink and drank my beer and wondered. Libby didn't say anything. After a moment... Rose took off to find Jamie, Libby went back to do bartender things, and I took out my banjo and sat there noodling. Carrie came in an hour later along with a compact, dark-haired, well-groomed guy with narrow eyes and a pale, short-haired woman with a loping, athletic walk. I would have guessed them both to be in their mid-twenties. They looked vaguely familiar, and it took me a minute to realize they had been with Susie and Carrie the night Susie and I met. But Carrie is the one who's... Uh, being all uh, flirty with Tom. Oh. Uh, I guess flirty is maybe <laughs> an understatement. <clears throat> Carrie said, is Tommy around? He was a couple hours ago, I said. I don't know where he is now. Okay. Uh, this is Justin, and this is Danielle. This is Billy. I said hello, and so did they. And Carrie announced that she was heading off to find Tom Tom. Danielle, who seemed to have uh, some trouble with English, said, uh, So, you are in a band with this Tom, yes? I nodded. I won't try to describe her accent. But for some reason, I felt that this was the time I was actually going to do. <laughs> it just feels right when they, when it's specifically that they don't, right, they're not yeah. speaking super clearly. Anyway, <clears throat> she said, I would like to meet him. The guy called Justin may have silently snorted. I'm not sure. He had beady eyes and his mustache was like mine, except smaller and more neat. I was running into a lot of mustaches like mine. The guy who was killed had one too. Maybe I should shave mine off. Yes, I said. Tom's a good guy. I really didn't want to start thinking about the dead man again. I remembered then that I dreamt about him, but I couldn't remember what the dream was. I said, does the phrase sugar bear mean anything to either of you? No. Why? Just wondering. Had they reacted? Maybe. Maybe not. Justin looked at me, then his eyes shifted away. I decided he squinted too much. I said, 
Uh, what do you people do? I'm a foreman for a construction company, said Justin. Danielle said, I take pictures of models, yes? A photographer, I said. What about you, she said. I just do music. She nodded. It is good that you can make a living at it, at doing what you want. I don't need much, I said. But still, isn't that what you're doing? Yes, she said and smiled. I like it. Nice smile. Justin studied his nails. Danielle said, uh, how did your band start? I wondered if she really wanted to know or if she was just making conversation. Hard question in any case, but I could pretty much stick to the truth. Uh, we met right here, I told her. At Cowboy Fangs. She pronounced it Fingers. Yeah. I thought you were from someplace different. Oh, we travel quite a bit. And you happened to... Jamie and Rose came in to hear some guy, and I opened for him. Opened? Uh, played first. Ah. We got to talking after the show, and I stopped as Jamie came walking up. Well, you can ask Jamie about it. About what? Hi, I'm Jamie. I said, Danielle, Dustin. Danielle was just uh, asking about how we got together. Oh, well, Rose and I introduced Billy to Bushmills Irish Whiskey. That was it, I said. Tom and Carrie joined us, and Carrie performed introductions. She seemed excited with the whole thing, almost hyper. Her arms flailed madly as she spoke, describing arcs and circles. I wondered if she was always like that. We brought Tom up to date to the conversation, and he said, that was about the time I met Rose and Jamie playing on the street. It was just a few days later, I think. Yeah, said Jamie. Then, what, a month later, maybe? We went back to hear another band and ran into Billy again, stayed up all night playing music, and had a band by morning. Thanks was the place, first place we played, too, said Tom, which, like the rest of the story, was true as far as it went. We still hadn't mentioned that it had been on, a, on another planet, in another solar system, in another time. And now you are back, said Daniel. It is wonderful. How many days will you play? I don't know, I said. This weekend, for sure. After that, we'll see. After speaking of perform And speaking of performances, anybody want to go see Susie tonight? The three locals said they were busy. Tom said he'd like to come along. I said, we probably won't want to stay out too late since I want to move tomorrow. Are you going to move it to yesterday or to today? Man, said Jamie. That almost isn't funny, I said. I don't know. I feel like it was a pretty good one. I want to move <laughs> tomorrow. Where are you going to move it to? <laughs> Tom is all dad jokes. Yep. Hey, some girls like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> oh, yes. The end of the chapter will be just the right amount of time. <clears throat> La Violette turned out to be only a few blocks away. One thing I've noticed about colonies is that most businesses seem unwilling to pay the expense of neon. I've about come to the conclusion that this is good. The outside of the place was covered in bright fluorescent paint with scenes of people dancing, and, well, it seemed both fun and inviting. We went in. I wondered how far back in human history the concept of bouncer goes, and if it all it's and if it has always been the, and if it has always been easy to pick them out. This one one wore. Uh, sorry, I want to stop being able to talk. This one had red curly hair, a wide face with a square chin, and he wore a sleeveless red uh, gray sweatshirt. He probably took steroids. We yelled at him over the music. Discovered he didn't speak English. But when I told him my name, he found it and Rose's on the pass list. After a brief discussion with Eve, the rest of our group was waved through. It was a sort of club that seems as if it would have, could have existed at any place at any time. Too dark, too crowded, even on a Sunday night. Air that was too stale and too full of smoke. The band was a five-piece called Les Sons Magiques. I couldn't hear anything except the bass drum, the electric bass, with the exception of occasional notes from a Strat copy set to armor piercing. There were two rooms full of people trying to drink enough to distract themselves from how crowded and stuffy the place was, and I was very glad we weren't there on a weekend. Sunday doesn't count as a weekend. Apparently not. I, I think he means like Friday night or Saturday night, but still, it's a weird way to say it. Yeah. This is great, shouted Rich into my ear. There's no accounting for taste. I shouted into his. I'd like it more if they'd mix the vocals higher. Why, he shouted back. You don't speak French anyway. A point. We found a table that was big enough for two. 
The six of us stood around it for a moment. Then Rich and Jamie wandered off and eventually came back with three chairs each. I don't know how they do these things. By that time, I'd begun to enjoy the swing quality to the beat and to appreciate some of the honky-tonk piano licks the keyboard player was throwing in. From the lead guitarist's expression, he wasn't taking things too seriously, which I liked as well. After watching him for a while, I decided he was sharing some sort of inside joke with the keyboard player. At least, they'd look at each other and laugh whenever they played a C major seventh. I still wished I could hear the vocals. Rich and Jamie set off once more, this time on a quest for drinks. By the time they returned, the band had taken a break, and there was canned music coming over the PA at just about the same volume. I didn't recognize any of it, which was interesting. We'd left behind most of what was popular when we left London and arrived at Ibrium City, but then there'd been a whole style of music influenced by the bop of the 1950s that had followed us as far as Jerrysport, and it seemed we'd finally left it behind in exchange for an approach based on classical European harmonies, broke melody lines, and Eastern European rhythms, the whole overlaid with some of the twisted minor key changes I recognized from French-Canadian fiddle tunes. The vocals were still mixed too low. Susie so came on at the beginning of the next set, at, at the next set, and yeah, she was a good dancer. She and another were positioned at either side of the stage, and they got a high proportion of the total lighting in the room, and from what I could see, the attention of the assembled hordes. She was wearing all black, and either makeup or the lighting was making her face even more pale than I'd remembered it. Someone, I don't remember who, told me redheads aren't supposed to wear black. Whoever said it was nuts. I had never heard that. Redheads aren't supposed to wear pink. Yeah. But I've never heard black. I guess probably because redheads tend to have very pale skin. Oh, that must be why. Yeah. Not like the hair is clashing, but like it doesn't suit your. Yeah. Color. I was like, like, I don't see why that would be kind of corpsey. Right. Yeah. Well, to each their own. But, you know, maybe that's what you're going for. <laughs> it looked like we made eye contact and there was a flicker of rec a recognition on her face. But I might have imagined that. I went back to watching the show. The other girl danced all right, but seemed a bit lackluster. The dancing involved wandering around the stage in a kind of shuffling walk, all but ignoring the music. Then, at irregular intervals that must have had their own internal logic, they would break into hyperactive ballet movements. It really did fit quite well. The dancing taking place on the floor involved keeping one's feet motionless, or else moving very little, while undulating one's shoulders and neck. It looked unhealthy. Eventually, Jamie and Rose got up and danced, and then I danced with Rose. They said it was more fun than it looked. We all drank some more. Tom drank non-alcoholic beer. I didn't smoke. There you have it. When the set ended, I had the bouncer send a message to Susie that we were there. She didn't appear right away, but I bought a drink for the lead guitarist, who was a pleasant fellow with very long brown hair and a shaggy beard. His name was Christian. And he turned out he spoke English and had a collection of old discs that included the Neville Brothers, Merle Travis, and B.B. King, as well as some that I probably should have known but didn't. I drank some more, and Tom started making jokes, but Christian didn't seem too put off. There was another set. Then there was another set, which was much like the first. Then the night was over. Christian stopped over to say goodbye, and we suggested he swing by Fangs next weekend, and he said he might. I had another gin and tonic while we waited for Susie and decided I wouldn't ask her whether I'd imagined her jumping at Sugar Bear yesterday. She could tell me or not. I also decided I didn't really want to let her know how hard I seemed to be falling for her. I had the impression that knowing about it might frighten her. After about half an hour, I asked about her and was told she'd left for the night. Then we went home. The next day, we moved into the apartment that What's-Her-Name had helped me find. <laughs> it was a much smaller production than you might think. We brought Rose's fiddle, my banjo, Tom's mandolin, and Jamie's six string. One bundle of bedding each, a coffee maker, coffee, and cocoa powder. Tom's new friend Carrie came along, and whenever nothing else was happening, they were looking soulfully into each other's eyes. It was to flow up. <laughs> we sat on the floor and did a few tunes and drank coffee. I was feeling a sort of pleasant melancholy, and it was one of those rare, wonderful evenings when everyone is glowing with each other's company, and you're not talking about anything important except that you are, and we didn't laugh much, but smiled a great deal. 
Later, Jamie and Rose and I drifted back to Fang's and I had spaghetti with white wine sauce, which Rose refused to touch because it had mushrooms in it. And Jamie pretended to be surprised about because it wasn't spicy and he thinks I can't eat anything that isn't spicy. Rose went off to practice, practice her scales and Jamie said, what's the plan for tomorrow? Nothing in particular, I said. You? He dropped his voice and leaned toward me conspiratorially. I'm going to try to figure out about this place. Oh, I'm going to start trying to figure out about this place. It was a moment before I realized he wasn't joking. Then I remembered he'd said before. What he'd said before. How are you going to do that? I don't know. I was hoping you might have some ideas. Exactly what are you trying to find out? Why is it that we keep landing places that are about to have nuclear weapons dropped on them? And why we keep bouncing out of them? Haven't you ever wondered? I think this last was irony. I said, there hasn't been much chance to wonder since we uh, departed London. And when we arrived there, I think we were all pretty much in shock. Well, that's true. Do you see any reason not to find out what I, um, do you see any reason not to try and find out what I can? Not offhand. Okay. Got any ideas how to go about it? I don't know. Start with asking Fred and Libby. Maybe they'd know something. Good idea. Want to help? No, I'm going to find a library. I want to find out what's happened in the universe since we've been away. For all I know, we jumped a couple hundred years. I doubt it, said Jamie. He looked around. I haven't seen anything really, you know, futuristic. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> Shut up, asshole. I must say, probably one of the reasons I love this book so much is uh, I love things set in the future, sci-fi, where they recognize that not everything changes all at once. Mm -hmm. Things change gradually. Yeah. Um, some things change very fast and some things change very slow. For example, this laptop I'm using is very different from a laptop 20 years ago. Um, this glass is not different from a glass 20 years ago. This book, well, this book is uh, more than 20 years old. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, mass market paperbacks still more or less look the same, you know? Yeah. Um, this couch is not super different from a couch from 20 years ago, you know? Yeah. Um, this coffee table is, in fact, uh, from the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, not everything changes right away. There's a lot of, uh, and as much as I love, like, Star Trek, for example, especially uh, The Next Generation, um, as much as I love it and grew up on it, it kind of assumes that, like, practically everything changes at once. Yeah. Well, not at once, but, you know, the only things they have that are old are, like, antiquities for like yeah. novelty's sake or whatever i sort of assumed that that was why they said it so far in the future well true uh but there's just a lot of you know, there's a lot of sci-fi stuff that just assume like literally everything is going to change your food will come in pill form like right that like, that's one of my least favorite things because yeah. like look people love food yeah maybe someday they will invent like pills that uh, people can eat that will be just as good as as having food in terms of nourishment and blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, but no one's ever going to eat that just for regular meals. Yeah, it's just not like, going to be like totally normal. That would be a thing that would be yeah. in refugee camps, or you would take camping with you, or something. Yeah, or or that people might buy just because they're like, oh, I live a busy life, blah blah blah. The kind of people who drink um, fucking uh, uh, Soylent or Huel, <laughs> all those like meal replacement things. I mean, we already have energy bars, so I mean, yeah, it's really not exactly. That, it's really not that strange to think about it eventually being more compact. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but people, it would not become like that. Is just what you eat all the time, right? Anyway, yeah, we're not all going to wear jumpsuits. For one thing, our body's physiology would have to change a fair bit for that to yeah. work. So anyway, I like I like uh, sci-fi where. Yeah. You know, Looper is a really good example of this. There are some things in Looper that are extremely right. sci fi, right. and then other things that are like, that is a car from 2012 that has had, you know, right. solar panels and like shit added to it because yeah. somebody like, you know, yeah, jerry rigged an old car to use some new technology, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I feel like Firefly was pretty good about that too. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a, a universe feel a lot more lived in. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Let's wrap this up. After my morning coffee with Coco, I set out to find a local library. It was an interesting experience, which led to three different bookstores in three different parts of town, before I figured out that library in French meant bookstore, and library was bibliothèque. After that, I found a pretty big one, and I sat down and began digging, and kept digging until I lost track of time. My diligence re was rewarded. 
First of all, I discovered in the English language section that New Quebec had been founded in what could be considered Earth Year 2306. Then I turned to the section on galactic history, wondered how long there had actually been a need for such a section. It took a while, but I found out what I wanted to know. I sat there until a library came along and a librarian came along and threw me out. I'm not sure how I managed to find my way back to Fangs, but I did, and I sat at the bar staring off into space. Libby wiped the bar in front of me and said, What's wrong, Billy? I shook my head. Is it that redhead who is in here? she asked. I shook my head again. She stared at me for a while, then said, Is there something I can get for you? I thought about that and its ramifications in a number of ways, and said, Lefroy. She poured me a tumbler and gave me a glass of water along with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a, that's a kind of scotch. It is very peaty scotch. The whiskey didn't go down smooth. It never does. But the taste is strong, and to me it tastes more like scotch than the other. A bagpiper I knew in London insisted that it tasted like bagpipes. <laughs> in point of fact... It tastes like I would imagine a peat bog to taste. Yep. I guess that's why I wanted it just then. I enjoyed it not only for its flavor and for its rarity on this planet, but for the fact that it was essentially irreplaceable, as was everything else produced on the radioactive ball that used to be the Earth. Mm. All right. And that is the end of chapter three. Oh. A heavy, it's a heavy thing to learn. Mm -mm. I mean, heavy situation to be in to begin with, uh, but finding out that you've jumped uh, as far ahead as 2306. I guess I didn't say what year relative, what relative year it was from the last place they were. Yeah. But we know that they started out in, they, I don't think they ever say the exact year, but it, it is made clear that they started out in uh, just a few years ahead of when the book was published. You know, like yeah. maybe the year 2000 at the at the latest. But right. I think it was supposed to be yeah. in the late 90s or something. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Oh, Aaron, that is a perfect way of putting it. The future is never evenly distributed. <laughs> Very good way of putting the it. The future is now. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's just something I always think about with sci-fi that, you know, yeah. your, your cell phone is like mind-bogglingly powerful compared to a cell phone from even... 15 years ago. Oh, apparently that's a William Gibson quote. So uh, I take away the credit I have attributed you incorrectly, Aaron. <laughs> um, but yeah, like your cell phone, a cell phone now, even a cheap cell phone is yeah. like worlds beyond, uh, you know, a cell phone 20 years ago. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, and even if like, if, if you went to Japan, your cell phone would seem horribly dated. Well, <laughs> my cell phone uh, is horribly dated compared to the newest well, Most yeah, but I mean, like, phones. state of the art in the U.S. is, I mean, unless it's, like, really, really, it, they're, they're just, they're just ahead. They're just ahead in, in that. I love that technology. But, uh, but yeah. Which is kind of a weird. We are still growing um, parsley and cilantro on our balcony in a tub of dirt. We don't have any sort of high-tech way of growing things, you know, on our, on our balcony. Hydroponics, we could try. I'm just saying, we don't, though. No, we don't. <laughs> and most people don't. We're we're arguably not growing them super well. We are we well, but we are growing those herbs the same, more or less the same way as people have been growing herbs for yep. hundreds of thousands of years. Yep. Um, oh, yep. Aaron points out everyone has super powerful computers, but we still travel by gasoline power. That's mm. a really good point. Oh, well, that that's, that's more complicated, right? <laughs> that uh, mm. brings up the. Um, the yeah. issue that some sci-fi writers deal with in in terms of like what is possible and what is subsidized what society yeah what will actually be allowed yeah. well i think that's i mean I think we that's could all be driving electric cars i think that's part of it that hard. yeah it's part of it that people assume as soon as something um is possible everyone will have it right you know that that's not that's the, the jetsons way of looking at the future right, right? Yeah. like your dog is a robot just because because robots, future, yeah. dogs will be robots. Like, I mean, robotic pets might be possible in the future, but people aren't going to stop having real pets, you know? Right, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, I think I've expounded on that topic long enough. I can let you guys go for the day. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. 
Um, if you are new to the channel, um, sorry that you missed the introduction to this book. Um, you can go back and watch it uh, in the playlist. Uh, also, uh, if you're new to me, uh, down below the video, there's links to my website, um, my music. I also released a short story collection as an audiobook in March. Uh, three short stories written by me, read by me and my friends. If you like hearing me read words at you, <laughs> you can have more of that. And it can be they can be ones I wrote this time, so I will f flub them less. Also, I <laughs> like edited it, you know, so it doesn't have uh, <clears throat> throat clearings and pauses to drink water and spill water on my stuff. So. <laughs> Aaron pointed out, we can communicate internationally instantaneously, but dresses still don't have pockets. <laughs> Some dresses oh. don't. Yes. Savvy is wondering, how's Pepper? Is he still in the box? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. We're going to go on a little Pepper. Okay. Pepper excursion. Pepper safari. Yes. I'm going to go find the Pepper. Mm -hmm. Pepper, how are you? Your adoring fans want to know how you're doing. Yeah. Uh, well, I was having a perfectly nice nap <laughs> until you, you know came up and held the camera in my face. Yeah. Yes, do you have anything to say for your adoring fans? No? Okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> there, uh, with that little trip to Pepperville, that <laughs> concludes our stream for the day. Thanks, everyone, uh, for tuning in, and I will see you tomorrow at 6.30 Pacific. We'll try to be on time again. So, <gasps> good night.